When I was a child, I was a capital B, capital N, big nerd. I was bully hard <laughs> because I was a loud mouth chubster who wore hand-me-downs and didn't love to bathe or brush my hair. In this photo, I have bullied my little brother into a Vogue-style photo shoot in which my mom no doubt encouraged. We'll get to her enabling ass later. Anyway, all of these things made me serious fodder for bullying in grade school, which I cannot totally blame the other kids for, but also fuck them forever. <laughs> Despite these many shortcomings, I always had this feeling I could be a star. There's no explaining it. Don't even try. All I can say is kids are nuts in general, and I was a full lunatic. My ambitions were in the theatrical arts, which is perfect, because what I lacked in charisma, I made up for in having zero natural talent. <laughs> Nevertheless, she persisted. Because not only was I going to shine bright like a diamond, I knew I was, but also because I wanted to give a middle finger to everyone back in middle school. Suck on it, losers, slash please, please like me, I desperately need at least one friend. <laughs> Encouraged by being cast in the chorus of a for-profit children's musical theater when I was eight, it began a love affair with performing. I mean, I was cast out of all of those kids auditioning, so didn't I have the elusive it? I would later learn that no, I did not in fact have it. Every kid who quote unquote auditioned and whose parents also had $100 made the cut. Here are some of the roles I played. I'm a witch named Zucchini. I don't, I don't know why my name was Zucchini. Um, but I mean, honestly, I've never looked better. She's an icon. Um, then there's this sad, impoverished villager. Poor thing. <laughs> Please note that I signed this picture as I thought it would be worth a lot of money one day. <laughs> and finally, Josh Goldberg and I were co-cast as a chorus member in Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat called Harry Ishmaelite. Here I am as a frankly problematic racist stereotype, which is obviously really bad now, but was also really bad then. Why did nobody stop this? I mean, look at me, yikes. All that being said, these meager and questionable roles did not stop me from believing in myself so hard. And I have to say, this is mainly because of my mom. My mom, bless her delusional heart, thought it could go all the way. All the way where? She did not know, but she knew I had to try. Plus, this was a much needed break from the torturous school experience, so hey, I was all in. When I was 10, I asked to take a class called Auditioning for the Camera in downtown Alameda, AKA Little Hollywood, Hollywood AKA very, very far from Hollywood, <laughs> but the birthplace of peanut butter. Okay, give it up. Um, <laughs> thank you. Alameda, sorry tangent, but my mom um, happily obliged. She said, baby, I don't know why you didn't want to do this sooner. You are meant to be on camera. I beamed knowing her words to be true. So on the first day of, of auditioning for the camera, I rolled in ready to shine. First, you should know a little bit about acting, kids, uh, acting classes for kids. They're basically glorified babysitting for kids with ADHD. <laughs> the people who run these things are master scam artists. Truly, they are the original grifters and we must respect and celebrate them. <laughs> they figured out a way to make $300 a head based on everyone's misguided notion that their child is special. <laughs> Most of these classes consisted of us standing in cir circles and playing zip zap zop. And then, the teacher would take a 45 minute smoke break and us kids would talk about things like our favorite audition monologues and whether we were more into Stella Adler method or favored Lee Strasberg. <laughs> These were my people. I finally fit in, it felt so good. Even if some of the people I fit in with sustained a mid-Atlantic, a classic mid-Atlantic accent for the entire class. <laughs> Keep in mind, this is a real conversation I had with an eight-year-old, the Stella Adler and Lee Strasberg conversation, who proceeded to get on camera and nervously eat his boogers until our exasperated teacher, Miss Carrie, yelled cut, at which point he sat down and continued to eat his boogers off camera. This is true, and I remember him well. He's actually pretty successful and works in TV now. His name is Peter Dinklage. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. He's such a some dumb writer, who cares? Um, and, and so, okay, in our final auditioning for camera class session, 
Miss Carrie taped us and told us she was sending the casting tapes to Los Angeles. Looking back, I should have immediately suspected that this was bullshit. <laughs> Miss Carrie was a 60-year-old woman teaching bad improv to preteens. How did she have a slew of glamorous agent friends? So I should have been suspicious, but of course I was not. I went home and waited for Hollywood to call. <laughs> and here's the craziest part, you guys. Hollywood did call. It turns out Miss Carrie did have some connections, and one of them just so happened to be casting for Roseanne's sassy fat kid neighbor. And guess who was perfect for the role? This sassy fat kid. <laughs> the execs had watched my tape and de decided I deserved a callback. What? OK, first, I need to explain how big Roseanne was at the time. She was the queen of television, and she was my everything. Of course, representation of fat people on TV is usually a joke and almost always terrible, but Roseanne was a fat woman who wasn't the butt of jokes. She was the maker of jokes. She was it and she was huge. We're not gonna talk about what she's up to these days. <laughs> I, was, I was flown to LA, first class, JK on Southwest, where every seat is first class, and I was immediately taken to get headshots. You guys, taking headshots is so fucking fun. Here I am giving cute and approachable glam. She is serving, okay? Here I am giving pure sex, okay? Here I am jauntily tipping my straw hat to camera while wearing gray sweatpants. What is this look? She doesn't know and I still don't. That night, my agents took me and my mom to Spago's, and I got to see James Earl Jones eating a bowl of spaghetti. Okay. I wanted to take a pic, but I didn't want to act weird because we're colleagues, so I abstained. It's called restraint, look it up. Um, but I have recreated this moment for you. I thought I could trust AI to make this photo for me, but it made this instead. I think it's because his most famous role is Darth Vader's voice. So um, I do think the spaghetti looks pretty good though, although the meatballs kind of look like avocado pits, whatever, AI is doing its best and I love and respect it, don't come for me robots. Um, now, uh, please get used to seeing this monstrosity for a full two minutes because I don't have another photo for a hot sec. <laughs> to this day, seeing James Earl Jones eating a bowl of spaghetti is the highlight of my life. Um, so the next day, after the James Earl Jones incident, I was taken to the studios and I believe it was Warner Brothers, and I was asked to read for some big wigs. You guys, I can say with all confidence that I fucking killed it. I read the hell out of those lines. I was both hilarious and touching, and I knew when I cocked my head and smiled, my crooked teeth and my double chin were winning over the hearts and minds of these producers. Lee and Stella would have been proud, and that's how, that's how hard I did the damn thing. And I was having a blast, due in no small part to the fact that I was treated like a great talent I always knew myself to be. And also, there was free food everywhere. Holly <laughs> Hollywood was already great, but then I learned about craft services and Hollywood went next level. I was, supposed to, I was supposed to be here eating free gushers and hobnobbing with J.E.J., James Earl Jones. For my final audition, I was taken to the actual soundstage where Roseanne was filmed. I mean, iconic, right? Don't you just have the shivers? It's here, why, and it's here in this moment where I proceeded to lose my shit in a very real way. I got to see her living room. I got to touch her couch. I got to smell her ashtray. My brain was short-circuiting. You have to understand, Roseanne was the hottest show on television. I was in her living room. I, a tiny chub, was standing in the living room of the most successful chub in the entire world. I was in awe. The producers took me to an office offset and had me read one final time for camera. I was told it was down to me and another girl and Roseanne personally would be choosing. All of these thoughts were reeling around in my head as the camera's green light blinked in my face. I knew this was my moment, and then I had to step up to the plate. And so what did I do? I fucking froze. I just froze. I know. The next day was sad. The next day I was taken to the stu- Oh, that's not what happened. I stared at the camera and recited the lines like a robot, and then I asked to lay down. We were immediately put back on a plane from Burbank to Oakland, and then, just as I had known that my auditioning for camera audition would be my ticket to Hollywood, this would be my ticket out. A few days later, we got the call from the agent. Roseanne didn't want me. I was too green. The role ended up going to some other girl. <laughs> and they dropped me, the agents dropped me immediately with the instruction to take more acting classes and maybe one day they could help me. I was distraught. A big part of me was doing this to rub it in the faces of the people who bullied me at school. 
Without that, what good was any of this? I was upset, I was inconsolable, and I had to go back to class as the loser normie who still had tangled hair and sometimes smelled like a public restroom. Sorry, I am just being honest. <laughs> anyway, what was this girl to do? Well, the answer is I went back to school and thoroughly lied my face off about being cast. Thank you, acting lessons. The kids were either very impressed, very skeptical, or very much did not give a shit. Either way, I was, it was all good because I switched schools the next year, and by, that time, by the time anything would air, I would always be, already be two counties, away and, two counties over and a lifetime away, and I could just be the crazy girl who lied about getting cast in Roseanne. I'll take it. <laughs> Months later, I was watching that episode of Roseanne, and my mom immediately changed the station, saying, that girl just doesn't have it. That's my story. Give it up for Laura Beck, her first time at VAMP. Laura's on Instagram at Mr. Panguino and would like to reiterate she's a writer, not a performer, so be nice to Laura when you see her after the show. And you know what? I think she is a performer. 